Okay, it is Monday, April 18, 2022 at 5 p.m. The Board of Commissioners of the Hardwick Electric Department is meeting. Commissioners O'Connell, Smith, Prevo, and Gedankin are present. Uh, General Manager Sullivan and uh, Beth Essery are present from Hardwick Electric. Ken Nolan is present from VEPSA. Uh, Shari Cornish is present from this, uh, the Hardwick Select Board. And um, Vince, I will let you introduce whoever's here from Craftsbury. You're muted, Vince. One more coming in. Okay, I guess I'd let them introduce themselves. Can't hear you. Uh, hi, Kevin, I, I think you're muted maybe. Hi, I'm Stan, I'm with the Crossbury Energy Committee. Hey, Stan. How can you yeah. hear me? Can hear yes. you now. All right, um, Kevin Gregoire from the Crossbury Energy Committee. Okay, and there's one other person who's joined. Looks can like you... Bruce, Bruce. Bruce Sherry, is that you? Um, Bruce, we can't hear you if you're trying to come through. Here comes another one. Maybe you can unmute Bruce. <clears throat> And I see a Michael coming, maybe Michael Ambrosino, who is. Ah, there he is. is here. Okay. From Florida. Uh, so all commissioners are present and Bruce, somebody is here. Bruce Sherry, if it's Bruce Sherry, he'd be the uh, uh, select board person from Crossbury. Oh, great. Well, welcome. Okay, so uh, are there any modifications to the agenda? Is there a motion? Yeah, yeah. I think we're going to have to add one uh, executive session, Lynn, to talk about the uh, adjustments with the bargaining unit so I can get you guys up to date on that. Okay. Anything else? Is there a motion to approve the agenda as amended? So moved. Is there a second? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Signify by raising your hand. The agenda is approved. The next item is the prior minutes meeting, the prior meetings minutes. Um, and I think there are some amendments that are needed um, to the language of the motions for executive session. Um, and I would suggest that we approve those minutes at our next meeting. I will move that we approve the minutes or entertain approval of the minutes at the next meeting. Is there second. a second for that? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Just so we'll take the, that was approved. So we'll take the minutes up at the next meeting. The next item on the agenda is the operating budget for 2022. And there were some modifications that were made to account for the fact that we already had experienced part of the year. Is there a mo is there a motion to approve the budget? So moved. Is there a second? A second. Any discussion? <clears throat> so I'll ask the question. So folks are satisfied that the changes that we had asked for have been made. Um, then we'll take a vote. Uh, all in favor of approving the budget that has been circulated. 
All opposed? I'm sorry, so I, that was one opposed and the rest in favor? I, don't I thought everybody was in favor. I, I thought Vince was opposed. I, oh, I might've been a little, I might've been a little late. I was in favor. Oh, okay. All right. On the record. Yeah. Okay, so, so the motion passes. All right, the next item is a website update. Looks great. Yeah, so it's all fired up. Things are hitting all cylinders. Uh, we have a few mods to make. Lynn had asked uh, for us to put a button up uh, on a more conspicuous spot for the commissioner's uh, link and information. And that's no problem. Uh, right now is the time to get it the way we want it. And uh, Beth and I definitely pulled some hair out on it, but I think Overall, we're really happy. And uh, like I said in my report, we're already getting lots of positive feedback on it from ratepayers. So, yeah. Is it, is it possible to have so that if somebody clicks on one of the commissioner's names to, to link to our email so that if somebody wants to ask us something? Yes. We, we can know that. Yeah, we can do that. that. Yeah. That would be, that would be, I think, a good thing to, to do. There was also, I don't know if you remember or not, when remember we had that one uh, email that you all took turns kind of babysitting. That didn't work very well. So that's that's why we got rid of that. And if you want to put them in so each of you has one for a click through, I think that's no problem. Well, I think it has to be an email that people look at. Some of us, I think, use our HED email and some of us don't, which right. is why I was thinking rather, I suspect that people may not want who, who don't use their HED email may not want their personal emails publicized, but if there's a way to have a link so that it's not visible, in other words, if, if it's someone's private email that, that that's not being broadcast to the, to the world, but somebody can send something to somebody if they, if they want to, a customer, a rate pair can send something. I think that- So let me make sure I understand it's okay to send it to your personal email as long as the customer doesn't see what that email address is. There are some of the commissioners. Well, I think I may be the only commissioner who uses my HED email for HED business. I think all of the other commissioners, I think, use personal emails. I believe that's correct. And and I'm suspecting, but there you know there are four other people here who use their personal emails who can speak up, that they may not want those emails. Put I'm, out I'm okay uh, as one one member. I'm okay with my personal email being shared. I am also. Yeah, me too. Well, if Michael is, then then yeah, then just then just put the emails, and you don't have to worry about a link. Huh, what happened to Mike? I don't know. We so Lynn, that. do you want your HED or? Yes, I use my uh -huh. HED email okay. for, for okay. HED business. That look, look, looks, looks great. Uh, photos are nice. There's one typo. Not uh, it, Typos are like a thing I just see right away. So it just, just in case you want to know. On tariffs and forms, uh, line specification sheets is um, just uh, says specification. Did you get line that, Lynn? Line extension. Uh, Lynn. Did you get that, Beth? I'm looking at it right now. Got it. Yeah, it's nicely laid out, you know. Really intuitive, and I, I like the uh, the fact that they're not scanned. PD, they're not scanned PDFs. They're you know regular PDFs. Beth, Beth, can we also get the minutes up from last year? <clears throat> from last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we can, Lynn. Yep. We just okay. threw on the ones that were handy by. Yeah. It would be good to keep up at least the last 12 months, if not more than that. Okay. I a think it's like a rolling 12 months. Well, I think it should be consistent 
Um, and actually, Shari's here, so she may know offhand what, what the select board does. But my recollection is it's at least a year's worth, if not more. Yeah, I'm not positive, but I'm sure there's as much on there. Casey would be the one to check with, but. Why, why, don't, why don't you, if Beth, if you could check with Casey and, and just do it on a consistent basis. Okay. Got it. Okay, anything else on the website? Okay. The next item is select board and uh, HED information flows and with the town. So Mike, you put this on the agenda, so. Uh, I put it on at your request that we needed to talk about how, uh, basically, how do we all get on the same page when customers are, or the public is trying to get information from HED and they end up with the town? Well, I think they're ending up with the town, at least my understanding is when they feel like they haven't gotten what they needed from HED. And that's, that's the concern. Um, and, and I think that we maybe need to be clearer about availability and, and just, and at the same time, I think when, when things come into the town, they, you know, they need to come back. Yeah, to or it's fair to say it's possible that someone may think they can expedite by starting with the town, not starting with HED, which is not productive. It's not a good use of the town, the select boards or the town manager's time. So we need to have people always <clears throat> start with Hardwick Electric, uh, which would be for, for, for new projects, Mike, I think would be you. But I, I, I think, so the process as I understand it is, is, you know, if we have a resident, I don't think the issue is so much with a residential customer coming in mm -hmm. because it's a fairly predictable process, but with other things coming on. And I think you included the, the electric vehicle charging station as, as, as an example, because there seems to have been some difference in communication um, that it would be, is there work or is there anything that we can do on a preliminary basis before someone puts in an application? In other words, uh, what we're, information- We're happy to, uh, happy always to chit chat with people. That's where I explain the demand rates and stuff. But as far as laying out a project, you have to execute a site visit with Brian to figure out what line design is gonna be needed or where, you know, if you need a three phase line and we only have a single phase line there, that's all done at the site visit. Yeah. The, the other thing that, that I think there was some confusion about, at least in, in what I saw, um, was, and, and I think we need to be, you know, we need to have some discussion about it. And this was, was, was what I was hoping that we would be able to ha start having some discussion about um, what kinds of rates, whether we should be looking at uh, separate rates for um, EV charging stations and what the costs of a study would be to uh, evaluate those and what the costs of filing for a rate would be. I mean, I think my view is that rates should be cost-based. And if we have a large load that's coming on on peak that we would normally charge a demand charge for, we should be charging a demand charge. And, if, and if, if that's the way an electric vehicle charging station behaves, we should be charging a demand charge for that. And if it, if it, if it doesn't, uh, then we shouldn't. Um, and they would be on more of a commercial rate. Um, but it would be, I think it would be helpful as, as people are looking at charging stations that we have some analysis to um, explain why the rate is the way it is, and if it's if it needs to change, then then we need to be thinking about going in for a rate filing. And if it doesn't, we need to be able to explain our position. I think. I don't know if others have other thoughts on the subject, especially with the if there are any level three chargers. 
Well, I would think, Mike, that a level three charger is the one that's most likely to result in a demand charge. Yes. And Lynn, and I, it would seem to me that this would be one of those areas that's evolving pretty quickly since it's developing now. And policies and practices are, are changing as it evolves. And I wonder if between VEPSA and more broadly looking across the state, try to determine what, what, the, what the different practices are and where we should be in that, in that spectrum of possible approaches. Hey, Mike, if you have your phone as well as the video going, turn your phone on. Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you fine. I can't hear you, but like you, if you can hear me, that's fine. No, you need I mean, to I mean, have to go us. back just to the phone because it doesn't want to pick up your, and it's not on mute. It's a Florida thing. <laughs> <laughs> we hear you, Mike. If I could well, just I, There was a little bit of feedback there, but um, what I was trying to encourage is, was trying to stay on the leading edge of, of what practices and policies and regulations are, are out there. And um, and being informed of those, and then you know Mike can make us aware of that, and 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 we can react accordingly, find the right place for Hardwick Electric, and and basically what it comes down to is whether or not it's going to be appropriate to, in effect, um, subsidize electric vehicle charging, in one way or another, which it is a delicate topic because it's in a sense shifting burden from 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 a select subgroup who have electric vehicles to our broader base of ratepayers if i understand that correctly so the the starting position is to handle it the way you described lynn equitably and and then what we need to be on our toes looking for is where there's a more i would say you know a more uh electric vehicle friendly approach being proposed, which is what I took from reading those, the email training. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure that that, that is necessarily what uh, was being requested in that email. I mean, from in terms of from the town of Hardwick, mm -hmm. um, I think, um, I think it was simply putting, passing along what, uh, the developer may be asking for. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I, I was speaking of the original email. Yeah, of the, yeah. the developer being a uh, proponent of, of, um, yeah. of lower rates. Well, all developers are on everything, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so what's the best, so if you agree, Lynn, what's the best way to do that? What's the best way to well, use- Well, Ken has his hand up and um, he may have some insight having perhaps having looked at this for, for others. So I, I, I'd welcome Ken offering his, his thoughts. Just, yeah, I'm sorry to weigh in on this one, but um, I think it's worth you being aware that uh, FEPSA was just given a $90,000 grant from the state. That's actually Department of Energy money to look specifically at electric vehicle charging rates. Um, so we're gonna be starting a pilot with Efficiency Vermont this summer to put chargers out, uh, these are more residential, a level two chargers, to try to get the load shape specific to the charging units in Depsis territory. And we're hiring uh, a national consulting firm, Utility Financial Services, to help us look at different options for rate design. So what you're describing as far as, you know, finding out what's out there nationally, looking at what the rate structure options are, that's just beginning. Uh, we're going to do that for all the members this summer and have more data for you once we get the consultant on board. And you said this is for level two, not for level three. It, it's level two. It's going to be um, two separate studies, one for in-home commercial residential and one for public charging. So both will be looked at. They're separate activities. Yeah. Great. So, that's super. That's exactly what, yeah, yeah, before yeah, we yeah. make a Hardwick electric policy, we need to be better informed. 
Uh, Ken, do you know if the level three chargers are capable of, of offering different rates and that the different rates would dis be displayed that way? I mean, it's a way of conveying the value of, of, of the speed of the charging. So at least people would have a choice and then the demand could be incorporated. I, I don't know if you know if they're capable of that. It seemed like that would be. Yeah, my, my understanding is they can, can display that in the public version. Um, you can you can put the different rates in place. It's really up to the, whoever owns the charging station as to how they display those rates. Right. So you get the ultra rate, and <laughs> people don't mind paying for it. If you're in a rush, you can pay more, and if you have a little more time, right. you can get a little rate. Okay, which takes us, is there anything further that anybody wants to talk about, about EV charging stations? So the ones that are being proposed by the state program are uh, level two, am I correct? I'm not sure who you're addressing the question to, Shari. I don't, I don't know either. The charging stations that Buffalo Mountain Market is talking about putting in uh, along with that uh, state program that they're putting uh, at Norwich. They're the, them. They're, it's not us doing it, it's the state. Um, it, it wasn't the state either from my understanding, Shari. It was a private developer. Yeah, Well, Norwich. they're working with uh, Gary Holloway. They're working with a program through the state. It's it's something that um, has come through the ACCD, the Agency I, for Commerce and Community Development, because Gary Holloway is the person that contacted me as the downtown commission um, and asked if we you know, had an interest in knowing what was going on. And that's what I passed on to, to uh, Opie or David. And then that went to you guys. So. But I just, I wanted to clarify because you're talking about level three and level two, the ones that they're talking about putting at Buffalo Mountain Co or Market, the new spot are level two, right? I don't, Mike, do you know? Level two, I believe two level twos. Yeah. And then what, what were so you So there was thinking? two, there were, not to say two too many times, but there was two kind of efforts going on. One of them, the one you're talking about, Sherry, was, uh, the original pass by Norwich, where they had obtained some state funds and targeted a bunch of towns, including Hardwick. Right. And Opie went around with Brian and they looked at multiple locations in town. And uh, Brian advised him then, which was a few months ago, yep, whichever one you guys want to do, have the developer get us an application. And, and that, as I understood it, that kind of blew over. And didn't no, happen. I think this is the same thing. This okay. is the same so thing. Then, yeah. So then there was a discussion between, I think it was me and Opie. And I said, you know, I bet Buffalo Market would love to have a couple of chargers. Why, why aren't you guys looking at that? And I never heard anything about that until these emails came around. And then just right. the other day, well, we got an application. Yeah. So just to cl clarify, it's the same, it's same program. Okay. So, um, you know, because the town was never doing it. Yeah, it was. So I, I'm, I guess I'm confused as to why they. They invited us to give them ideas about where potentially we'd like to see it placed. That was the only thing that we got to participate oh. in. Suggesting. Right, but the, the parking lot right across the street mm -hmm. was one of the ones that was evaluated and it's, you know, less than a pole away. It already had a meter there and everything ready to go. Right. So I don't know. That, but that's, that's why not, I thought it was something different. Yeah, we just got to suggest. And then apparently they decided that it would be more useful in the Buffalo Mountain Market. I don't know. Because they're going to repave the parking lot and the town's not going to repave the parking right, lot. Right, I mean, I don't know. But that that's what it seems like it is. But um, it's all the same deal. Okay. Um, and then I'm curious, are, uh, is HED still thinking about putting a charging station in the HED parking lot? Yes, we are putting one in as soon and as our retaining wall is replaced. Yep. 
That would be a level two also? Two, level two, yep. And one, just one. Uh, it's a level two with two, two feeders out of it. So it'll be, okay. you could charge two cars at the same time. Okay. Okay, well, that, yeah. So I just wanted to clarify that because I, I have a hard time following it all as well. So I just thought I'd see if I could make more sense of it in my own head, but yeah. Yeah, that was a big, the one would it be here in our parking Mike? lot was a big, uh, big positive for the rail trail because this is a great uh, parking right. area on the weekend. There's nobody here and it's a great place to park and use the trail. Right, right. So Mike, would it be worth confirming what the next steps are? And just to confirm who's in the lead because based on that developer consulting the town on locations, you know, a dialogue got started there. I think to execute this, it has to be shifted over to Hardwick Electric and we have to make sure we're- And really it is now. We, yeah. we, we've received an application for service and our standard right. operating procedures have been started. And okay. in your view, are there gonna be any decisions required? For example, is there a demand charge issue with level two? Is there any other issue that's gonna require um, in effect policy making by us? I don't believe so, no. Great, so it's a straightforward, you yes. know, the only problem, the only friction point could be if, if, if you find with Brian that there's some cost that people don't like, you know, that it's too costly for some reason or another. Right, right. If they, so it's gonna require a one pole primary line extension, new transformer bank, new service, all that. So as long as they're ready to incur that development cost, then it should be straightforward as can be. So yeah. that's the difference between one side of the road and the other. Yeah, on the on the existing, uh, the south side of the road, everything's already there. It would have been really easy to just put the chargers in. But, but Mike, didn't the applicant make a request for uh, reduced prices the way Green Mountain does in some places? Uh, they suggested that Green Mountain uh, Power had waived demand fees, et cetera, but I mean, you, you can't waive your tariff rules and requirements. It's, that's our, those are our laws as derived under the PUC. You can't change them. Uh, yeah, I actually, when I saw that in the, in the email chain, I went and looked at, at Green Mountain Power's tariffs and I couldn't find anything that was a special rate for, for electric vehicle chargers. So if, if they're at a use level that would incur a demand charge, they would have to be paying a demand charge. As Mike yeah. said, you know, we, we are obliged to charge our customers the filed tariffs, not any more, not any less. Um, right. So. Um, Good. So this, this, it looks like, Sherry, I'm only probing this because you've invested your time to be here today is, can, and, and I think everybody has an interest in getting the chargers installed, sort of helping the developer develop it if we can. And it sounds like the application's in, we roll forward, we tell them how much it's gonna cost to, to, to set it up. They may balk at that. The only solution to that is really attracting other money, other funds. There's a lot of funds floating around now. You know, can we attract other funds to help subsidize that infrastructure or have them look across the street again? Sort of to, I don't I don't know if there's anything else. I don't want to solve a problem that doesn't exist yet. Hey, yeah, I don't that's the course yeah. forward. I, I I don't have a clear understanding of the difference between in the co-op parking lot versus across the street, but I didn't make that application. So yeah, who makes the application? Was it so Norwich, the developer Norwich actually filed. Yep, Norwich filed the application for service. Yep. Huh. Mike, can we put something? Has Norwich done an agreement with the co-op? Um, I, I mean, can we put in something if if Norwich doesn't, you know, hasn't, doesn't have an agreement with the co-op if it's the co-op's property. I believe the, the, um, I mean, maybe they do and that would be great. The application specified that it's uh, going on Buffalo Mountain co-op property and it's, hmm. it's with their uh -huh. approval. 
yeah, we're not going to build it. We can't build our stuff without an easement from the property owner. Hmm. I mean, I would get, I, I would be surprised if the co-op wouldn't want it, but again, I suppose it depends on what happens to the spaces. Right, it means they have fewer spaces. Exactly, in exactly. So, yeah, I wonder if there's a little. little I, 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 yeah. <laughs> right, I don't know. I don't have any. You know, I. You know, my interest is that we that we have them downtown. You know, yeah. for tourism dollars and for um, just the way that the future is going. Like, I want to see those happen in downtown, um, and it seems like. Hmm, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. So, so our, our standard process to provide services will bring that all out, shake it all out of the wash, and we'll know who it is, where it's going, who owns it, whether they have permission, all that stuff. Okay. Right. And if it's if it costs less overall to put it across the street from the co-op, why wouldn't we do that? So why wouldn't they have applied for that? I wonder. Not sure. Yeah. But I'm sure that'll be discussed when Brian meets with them, which I think is set up for this Thursday. Okay. Okay. Well, maybe we'll know more by the select board meeting on Thursday night. We'll see. Okay. Anything else on the EV charging station? Which takes us to uh, the discussion of the possible microgrid project in Craftsbury. Hey, Mike, can you hear us now? I can, yes. Oh, and I hear you. Per perfect. <laughs> so, Vince, uh, you know, I'm not sure how we approach this um as you saw in the email from eli we been advised by council not to enter into an mou at this stage um, uh, I, I actually i didn't i didn't see that i just saw his admonition that um uh, it should say may instead of will. No, that wasn't just what he said. He said more than that. Um, yeah, that was, yeah. Um, I don't have his email in front of me this second. There's been a lot, you know, of back and forth, but um, I read and uh, I don't know how other commissioners read it, but it was with reference to the MOU and also with reference to the LOI and we've not seen an updated LOI. Um, the MOU uh, still refers to people as being partners. And I think Eli was, was quite clear that at this point, we should only be referred to as a potential partner uh, that he didn't see the need, you know, see us entering into an MOU. Um, the MOU has things that are inconsistent with the last draft of the LOI, at least that I've seen. I don't know if others have seen anything more recent. Um, but for example, the LOI that I've seen says that the town of Craftsbury has committed $50,000 in ARPA funds to this project. And the revised MOU that you sent says that they may uh, commit that. Um, and I didn't know, I looked at, at uh, the, just trying to understand what was happening and uh, I didn't see anything mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the Craftsbury minutes either for the select board or the ARPA committee um, that there'd been a commitment. Um, I'm tr I, that, that was just one example, right. but there, there are other things in here as well. Um, It's an interesting project, but I think there are a lot of interesting storage possibilities. And it's, we have to evaluate them on the basis of what would be the benefit to all of, of HED's rate payers. And it's, it's and we, we've certainly not been able to, to verify uh, everything that's in the, in the LOI, uh, which of course, when it's signed, the signer is saying that it's true and correct. 
um, that that's part of the, as I understand it, the letter of intent rules that USDA puts out. Right, to the best of their knowledge. Uh, I didn't see a knowledge qualifier in the form. I just saw something that said it's true and correct, that they're confirming that it's true and correct, that everything in it is true and correct. Okay, um, that, that's, I didn't see that in the, uh, I saw in the uh, federal the register notice that it's, it was, well, I'd have, I'm going on memory. <laughs> That's what I remember. Yeah, so the, no. you may be correct. I, I, I just remembered that. Anyway, you know, and, and there are things in there that, as I say, we can't verify, certainly in terms of the savings to HED's customers at this point, because the project just isn't fully fleshed out. We don't know what all the parameters are. You, you I think in, in, in the LOI, you indicated that the site is uncertain. I, I understand, you know, this, Craftsbury Academy, I think, is a historic building. There's, there may be historic preservation issues in putting panels on it. There could be, you know, I don't know if, if there are wetlands around, um, but that can affect things. No, that, and those are those are all those are all potential issues. No, completely right. True. Right. But but for us to commit at this stage to a project that may not happen, and in the meantime foreclose us from participating in other projects is is uh, is a problem um, sure and, and uh, are there any other projects on the horizon that have been brought to Hardwick Electric for example well we're aware that Vepsa is looking into yes. into things I, you know Ken I don't know if you can say a few words about the kinds of, of, of things that are out there as potential without you know disclosing anything that you can't disclose <laughs> Sure. Um, Mike's seen some of this in, in his role as up as a board member, but um, we we did go out to, with an RFP last year uh, seeking a, a partner for storage. Um, we've we've landed with a company at this point, and we've which which one? Uh, they're called Delorean Power. Huh. Um, they're they're out of uh, Virginia. Is their home base. Um, Getting established here in Vermont, they got partnerships with a number of entities, engineering firms, and construction companies at this point. Uh, doing a lot of work in Massachusetts right now. They um, switched from cars, I guess, stainless steel cars. Yeah. <laughs> That's a <laughs> former uh, World Bank person and a FERC uh, battery uh, attorney, basically, that created this partnership. And they got some uh, hedge fund capital to, to start them up. Um, what, what, what kind of structure are you talking about? Is this uh, their ownership as a as a as an investor? Is this a? Uh, I mean, I, I, the reason I ask is I'm just trying to get a lay of the land for what we're talking about and what they're talking about because there are a lot of there are a lot of people, you know, scale energy. Uh, so I, I asked Ken to join us tonight, Vince, to give us. Um, kind of a, the philosophy and the overview and the structure of what Vets is looking at as a comparison sure. um, to, to your project. So if you let him do his thing, I think he'll answer most of your questions. Yeah, I'm ha happy to come back afterwards, but the the structure we're looking at, so we, we similar to what we did with Encore Renewables on the solar side, where we entered a partnership and then had them look at locations around all the members' territories for where we might find viable projects. We're doing the same type of thing with DeLorean right now. Now they've they've started um, they're looking at projects in Ludlow at Okemo Mountain and the Magris Talc Company there. Um, they're looking at Northfield um, around the Norwich University area, um, looking at a site in Lindenville next to the substation. We, we, we started with folks where we knew we had high levels of interest and identified locations already. Um, we're planning on expanding that out. And it sounds like, you know, Hardwick may be one of the next ones in line. You appear to have a few locations that might be of interest. But the, the structure we're envisioning at this point is um, it would be DeLorean Power and their partner owning the battery. Um, potentially owning the land or leasing the land. We would operate the batteries as a, a network across VEPSA to reduce, sim similar to what you've talked about here, capacity and transmission costs. Um, 
the, the unique thing about them, at least at this point, we're still negotiating contracts, but they're, they've actually offered a performance guarantee on, on the capacity savings. So we would enter a, a power, essentially a power purchase agreement or ESSA energy storage services agreement with them um, that would have a fixed price to it. But if they did not hit the peaks that they have projected, then there would be a reduction in price to compensate us for the lost value. Um, that's the pro yeah. proposal they've brought forward at this point. And what kind of peak to... coverage are, are they talking about, for example? I'm sorry. Say... What kind of peak coverage are they talking about? Uh, what, what's the performance guarantee? 85%, 90%, 80 they've... Well, their first proposal, we're not done negotiating. Their first proposal was 90% uh, guarantee. Wow, that's, yeah. Uh, uh, it, you're talking about, you have a dedicated like 400 hour block, for example, is that? Yeah. And you, you guys are doing the, uh, the they're doing the uh, peak matching. Yeah, so, okay, I guess they would, yeah. When we put the battery in a particular location, we would set the parameters for what we want them to meet, the capacity, what transmission requirements and all of that. And then it's their responsibility to activate the battery to meet those requirements. And this is solar plus storage or this, this is a battery like in Heinsberg, for example, or Barry? We, we entered it with just talking about storage. Um, but they are open to combination projects if we find a site that, that will work for that. So you guys are providing the, the charging or, or are they purchasing the charging of the, uh, how, how does, I'm just curious how that works. Yeah, it's, it's envisioned that the, the charging the battery would be at retail rates and that would be um, reflected in the power purchase agreement that we're signing. So essentially we're paying for it because it's, the cost is built into the, the rate that they're charging us. Okay. So, but you guys are, it's, it's part of your power supply that's going into, uh, well, whoever, I mean, would this be a, a specific, yeah, it'd be specific to whoever the uh, utility was, wherever it was stored, it's gotta be inside the boundaries. Correct. So, um, Okay, so but I mean, this this is really good to know. I mean, it it, it would have been good to know beforehand. Just to, it might have saved some time and energy, you know, to know this kind of, that this kind of planning is taking place. Because so it's just it's good PR. It's good to know from for the board's perspective that you know the climate action plans being uh, addressed and implemented, comprehensive energy plan. Uh, so. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's good news. I mean, you know, it, it does conflict with what we're trying to do, but I, that's not necessarily a bad thing because it's still uh, fulfilling a lot of the goals of what we are proposing. I, and I, I know, you know, the, the numbers that I gave, you know, I talked to Sean and he was nice enough to go through the stuff with me. And then I talked to um, somebody from CEG and then somebody from a, an actual, uh, uh, load management company, the type of company you're talking about that that manages the peak loads, and they said these you know these numbers were reasonable. They were in with they were within market range for uh, you know for a ten year contract, for example. You know something it could be lower, it could be a little higher. It just depends. I mean, there's one utility just to go off uh, an interesting aside uh, in Mass that was very similar to Hardwick Electric. They, I mean, they hit these load reduction peaks perfectly and they made on a, on a similar it's the same size utility as hardware electric made four hundred thousand dollars a year on a one megawatt hour i mean one megawatt four megawatt hour battery it's pretty interesting but anyway that's just an aside um okay so uh regarding the mou i mean I, i'm i'm looking for the uh, email i thought i had it up uh, and i thought i addressed the stuff that uh yeah, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, we're getting down to the wire. What I'm it, hearing it, is, is that uh, yeah, basically that this would require more study, it would take more time, uh, that there's some conflict with uh, VEPSAs. You know, I mean, I, I don't see a timeline for 
for this implementation for hardware? I mean, I, you know, uh, I mean, do you have any, something like that? I mean, is there, you, I know it's in the plans, but uh, is there a timeline for that? The feedback I have from Sean is that we're, our uh, Billings Road expansion is an excellent location. So I'm assuming we're next on the hit list, Ken, but I, you're, you have the answer to that, not me. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, um, DeLorean has been very responsive. So as we've given them new sites to look at, they're, they're pretty quick to take their first preliminary cut. And then from there, it's just a matter of how quickly they can identify either it doesn't work or we move it to the interconnection process so they can start to figure out the cost. So if, if we think Billings Road is reasonable to move forward with and, and the commission supportive of that, we can have them out there in a, a few weeks if, if you'd like to. Is, do there, that. is there any- So the, the single, that? one of the single biggest concerns for any and all of these projects is that they have to essentially be um, custom designed to your system and the circuit that they're on. So depending on the circuit construction and the amount of solar energy that's on, on a circuit already might preclude that circuit from being in consideration or might make it the best option in the system, but we don't know. Uh, we haven't got that data to say this is a great location or that's a bad location. Or, and right. if you do, if you do one, that installation in your system may preclude you from using a superior site somewhere else that would provide more benefit. So, I mean, are you guys going to engage in uh, operating envelope agreement or is this going to be a standard interconnection? The, the reason I ask is because those are being used to good effect with uh, fewer limitations and uh, it allows adaptation of, of the agreement. I, I mean, you know, yeah, I, I guess that's my question. What, what type I of- I don't think any of that has been determined. I think this is, right. this is, this is an investigative process. We're trying to, to assess what the options are, what's the best option for the system um, right. and, and, then, and then we can proceed with something. And, and you know, the particular contract structure is, is something that will be worked out down the, down the road. Exactly. <laughs> you know, just, like, um, just like after the MOU. <laughs> no, but the difference is making a commitment. And one of the concerns that I have is whether, whether there's an MOU or not, I, I would not want to see Hardwick Electric be in the position of creating expectations of people doing things, relying on Hardwick Electric, going forward with something, which, which may turn out not to be in the best interests of our rate payers. And we just don't know that at this point. And at the same time, what I understood from the LOI is that Craftsbury needs a backup generator for Craftsbury Academy. Uh, and, you know, I had asked Mike, what are the outages that we've experienced? What are the requirements for our system? And the target that it's imposed from what I understand from Mike is um, three and a half or fewer events per year with a duration of 2.4 hours or less. Sure, Mike can correct me if I, I may have gotten that wrong. And, and the cost of operating a propane generator for that amount of time is, Mike, you said was $176 about? Yep. And, and in fact, we've beaten those targets for the last two years. Um, so the environmental cost of running it, if it would even be run for something of that short a duration, the outage happens in the middle of the night, it, it, it may not be run at all, but, but that gives, folks an outside parameter. And given that it's running so little, the environmental costs are, are, are minimal. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I, I, I mean, the, the, what is it, SCADA, the, C, the outage and duration Safety data. Safety and that, Katie, yep, you got yeah, it. That, that I looked at was, you know, it was similar to that. What I saw was a little bit higher, but it really not a, uh, 
not a relevant amount. Uh, and I agree, that's why it's only one of the, the uses, it's a multiple use um, device that's, you know. Uh, Ken, I have a question for you. Um, uh, wouldn't a microgrid in Crashberry uh, be a complementary uh, program to uh, a microgrid that you're proposing in the so-called ideal site? I, I don't know that I can answer that sitting here tonight. Um, you know, Mike, is Crashberry on a separate circuit? from your H11s or Billings Road site? Yeah, separate substation too. Yeah, so conceivably, since they're on separate substations, you could run them in tandem. Um, it's but in our in our contingency system, they'd be tied together. So that would that would all come out in the system impact study. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the complexity you'd have to look at is running both on normal operation and then under an outage or contingency basis, you'd have to look at what the loading is, how the lines are connected together. But I, I don't wanna seem like I'm hedging, but we, we looked at this type of scenario in Morrisville, for example, we looked at another site where they've got a circuit with two large solar projects on it. And we proposed a battery, which I personally thought would be a slam dunk the battery is right next to one of the solar projects we own already owned the land it seemed very simplistic um, and then when we got into analyzing how that would operate we actually had to downsize the battery so we went in <coughs> five megawatts we found we could only fit about a three megawatt and even then under certain hours we would have to curtail production the interconnection turned out to be a lot more difficult than we thought so as Mike described, you need, you potentially could have a site in Crassberry and a site at the Billings Road, but they would each have to be evaluated based on the particular structure of the line, what generation is on there, what the load on those circuits is, and designed accordingly. In which uh, having the infrastructure inventory would really make it, make it a plug in, plug in the numbers in. So the, the curtailment piece is, um, so right now there's 700 and, I'm not gonna throw the number out. There's many hundred, I think it is, 730 KW of solar generation on the Craftsbury circuit. And on a good sunny day, uh, that circuit about halfway out from the substation only has a few amps flowing on it. So if you had, the opportunity to connect a battery out there, there would be no load to connect it to, which falls into the curtailment piece Ken is talking about. Hey, we got this great battery, but we can't do anything with it because it's oversized or undersized. It, there's no load, Mike, until after the sun goes down, right? When people are using air conditioners and uh, heat pumps and so forth. Sure, people use heat pumps and air conditioners. Absolutely, we we peaks are later in the day uh, and getting later every year. So of course, there's a demand for a battery. Then I think there's a demand for battery in our system. Yes. Another question I have: Ken, are you with Vepsa or who? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, my name's Ken Nolan. I'm the general manager at BEPSA. Excellent. Um, so <clears throat> Lynn and other uh, commissioners, I have heard that you have consulted with Ken uh, and verified the numbers that uh, Vince put forth uh, on the uh, microgrid proposal. And I hear that VEPSA has verified that these numbers. Now I hear that you're saying, Lynn, that they are in question. Um, so how can you be on both sides of the fence? You're muted, Lynn. We've had limited discussion with VEPSA. We have not gotten into great detail about the assumptions that are in there. And in any case, those numbers are gross numbers, they're not net of the costs that would 
be incurred by Hardwick Electric associated with those numbers. If you're putting in a net metering installation, then we're gonna see a revenue loss from the net metering. Um, that could be substantial. That's just one cost. Uh, there, there are other costs potentially associated with it. Right. So I, you know, we, we, we have not verified all of the analysis. It's that simple, and and so that's that's how that's how we can make that statement. Yeah, I mean that, that's specific. I mean the net metering is related to the PPA, not the ESSA. So I mean there would be you know there would be revenue loss, but it would be part of the production, not part of the. But it's it's the whole the part of the whole pro it's part of the whole project, Vince. And if we're going to look at the project, and you're asking us to sign up to support the project. We have to look at the, at the effects of the entire project. And there are parts of the project that, again, we cannot, as Hardwick Electric, be signing on to a project that part of the project is to benefit customers who live in one town, but not in, it, in the rest of our towns. I, I, I hear you, but that's not, you know, I mean, it's clearly presented whether you can agree with the, the actual um, kilowatt month uh, tariff savings or not, if it was $2, it would be a savings for all the rate payers. It, it wouldn't just be a benefit to Hardwick to Craftsbury. The, the loss of revenue is a loss of revenue to all the rate payers. I'm, I'm sure, what, which loss of revenue? I'm not sure. Associated with additional net metering on the system. Uh, you would we actually, lose, yeah, lose. okay. Yeah, that, that's, no, no, hang, hang on, hang on. I, I, I just need to dredge up the details of that. That's part of the, the uh, power purchase agreement that there, whatever the rate is could be negotiated. And that's so that it does benefit both, both entities. And think, you know, that's- uh, Vince, you had net metering. First of all, net metering is based on a tariff. It's not, it's not a power purchase agreement. There was net meet, I thought there was net metering. I think others have read this also and thought you were talking about net metering for, for, for Craftsbury Academy. You yep. had net metering for Craftsbury Academy. Right. I think some other customers as well. We Hardwick Electric loses money because we're because we're getting less of a contribution to our fixed costs for every kilowatt hour that we are paying for net metering. That's a kilowatt hour that we don't sell, and it's a kilowatt hour that makes no contribution to the distribution system and the transmission system that supports the net metering. Right. So that's, that's, that's a problem with net metering. We're obliged to do it. It's, it's, it's the state law. So we, you know, we have a net metering tariff, but it's, it's, it is in comparison to what we pay for H11, it is substantially more. We're H11, we're paying less than the market price of power. Um, yeah, it's nine cents. Well, we also get Rex, so it's no. It's that's with the Rex. It, it's ninety dollars a, ki a kilowatt hour. I mean, no, a megawatt hour. No, it's nine plus the Rex. I think it was forty plus the uh, fifty plus the forty for the Rex valuation. I mean, that's that's what we, I read. We pay nine cents a kilowatt hour for every kilowatt hour out of that plant, and we get all electrical attributes, including the Rex credits, which reduces. Okay, well, that's which reduces the nine cents. Right, okay, well then I stand corrected because that makes it a reasonable value. I mean, I remember asking about $90 a megawatt hour which seemed pretty high from a market rate. But in any case, that's, uh, okay. So uh, it, it, say for example, j just hypothetically, uh, no problem, the, uh, you know, Crassbury, uh, the town of Crassbury applies for, uh, uh, you know, a standard offer uh, installation for community solar. And then, um, or, or, they, uh, or the, the school installs a, you know, gets a 150, um, installs a 150 kilowatt uh, system and creates a uh, net metering uh, group. And that ends up well, I'm just thinking of the relative costs. Uh, all right, so I guess uh, if it's part of the pro the project, 
um, it, and it could be structured that there would be a number of uh, sub, you know, whatever the uh, PUC limitation is, a number of sub um, sub installations that wouldn't be part of the same project, and that would have to go through the standard process for net metering and create a community net metering uh, group, a number of groups, which would ultimately end up having a lot less benefit for, for hydroelectric electric than a PPA with net metering and the balance sold at a, at a uh, you know, whatever the, whatever the negotiated price was. I'm just saying it, it could, if the alternative was implemented, it would end up costing hydroelectric electric a lot of money rather than uh, this proposal, for example. So I guess what I'm saying is that that you know I mean that's a possibility on the part of Crassberry or or uh, a separately uh, formed uh, energy committee uh, not under the auspices of uh, the town of Crassberry. I'm just saying what we can propose under under you know PUC regulations. So I mean uh, I'm 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 bringing I'm putting that forth. As, People can do net metering. That's right. Right, and I'm putting that forth as an alternative to you know, paying closer attention to this project uh, because it could, this project, yeah, you know, and, and I'm not saying there, there aren't issues. I, I completely agree, but at the same time, I think it's a, it's a good opportunity. And um, I apologize if I haven't sent you the updated LOI. I've been trying to keep up with on a number of fronts. And uh, if I haven't sent you the updated one, but it did have uh, some additional structure that I thought would help the, the process. Um, Vince, do you see the difficulty for us to sign up and say we I, I do, I do. something when we haven't seen it? We cannot do that. I, I, I do. And at the same time, I talked to the administrator and they said it was uh, part of this is the way the process goes, that there is no commitment. Uh, that's there's it's, no it, it, it there. They acknowledge and verify that there's no commitment uh, because these things are so incremental there's and they're no so nebulous. Vince, there's no commitment to USDA, apart from the commitment that you're saying that everything in the letter is correct, is true and correct. Apart from that, there's no obligation to go forward as far as USDA is concerned with the project at this point. I agree with that. But the difference is if Hardwick Electric says to the town of Craftsbury that we are supporting this project and we are ready to go forward with it. And then as we learn more about it and learn more about other options, if it turns out that we can't go forward with it, even if we're not legally committed to do it, we don't wanna put any customer in that position of, of having relied on something that, that we were going to do and then be in a position to then be in the, the untenable position of, of having to say that we can't, especially when, again, and I don't know what Craftsbury's needs are independently, right. but what I understand that the driver, let me finish. What I understand is that the driver for this project for the town was the need for a backup generation for Craftsbury Academy. And, if that's the case, then then I don't want I don't think Hardwick Electric wants to be in the position of stringing out that process and then possibly pulling back at, at a later date. And uh, I I just I, and I'm expressing my view. There there are yeah. other commissioners who who you know may have different views, but yeah. I am concerned about doing that on the basis of data that 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 we have not had ample time. To study or get independent advice on, and and your your point is well taken. And the one thing, the just a small correction that it wasn't this wasn't the the backup generator wasn't the driver. It was uh, it was a uh, it was a precipitating event, which is different than the driver. So and the other thing is okay. So it may there are two issues here. One that there's an obligation, and the other one is that it's a possible elimination of a better of a better alternative. I mean, that's, but the, the second one, the elimination of a better alternative, that's always the case. I mean, there, there can always be something down the road that's better. Well, we thought this would be better. So I, I, I hear you. And I also hear that, you know, uh, there are too many issues. Well, actually, yeah, sorry. I, I should, what I should do is just let any other of the commissioners just um, 
Yes, I would like to hear from other commissioners. I had a question. I was wondering how a party company, DeLorean, could do a similar project and have it be more beneficial to the ratepayers than our nonprofit project that has a three million dollar, two to three million dollar grant. How is that possible to be better for the ratepayers? That's not possible. I, I, I think that's a legitimate question, Stan, that the fact that, you know, the, the startup money ends up creating, a, it creates a system while, with numbers verified or unverified, it creates a system at no cost. There are some costs, there are interconnection costs. It's, it's you know, the, the budget, while not super detailed, does have the major costs uh, in, uh, outlined. So, I understand the hesitation because of the unknowns and the possible obligations on the part of the ratepayers. Uh, at the same time, it's like it's like mana from heaven. It's something that drops can have dropped into the lap of Hydric Electric, regardless of what the. I guess what it leads me to ask is: Is it a matter of uh, needing more time? Uh, to go over the numbers and the viability of this project uh, as regards um, Hardwick Electric being a partner. Does it, anybody have any? Well, Lynn, do you want? Yeah, you can want I just say something? So I think there, I'm sorry, go ahead now. Uh, do you want comments from the rest of us or not? Please, yes. Well, I understand you do events, but <laughs> uh, no, everybody's free to speak. This is this is a public yeah, meeting. And... I'm free to speak. On the other hand, um, Vince has apparently not seen that uh, note from Eli. I think he, that should be sent to him. It was uh, sent to him. Uh, he says he doesn't have it. Well, I, I, I did have one of them, and, and I may not have read it completely. I'm looking for it right now. Oh, okay. Uh, who is uh, Eli? He's, he's, he's hard with he's electric, lawyer. regulatory counsel. But I, uh, right now, I would say that your argument, Vince, rests on some data that is certainly challengeable. Uh, secondly, I would note that um, according to Eli, there are a number of legal entities that almost surely have to be created and that they will be expensive and we would like to see some of some of those done beforehand. Thirdly, and Lynn has mentioned this, uh, as long as there's any chance that our ratepayers who don't live in Craftsbury are in any way financially hurt by this, we simply can't move ahead. And at this point, we don't see any finances supported by the Craftsbury community. I mean, you don't have a, a big uh project that has been so the, the trustees of sterling uh I, it's not clear to me that the uh, select board has committed fifty thousand, or at least pledged it uh you've applied for monies elsewhere that's good but it would be nice to see some pledges um this i mean we've already hardwick electric has already spent money on lawyers and we will continue to do so as needed but uh, it, it would be assuring to see that the Casper community had put forward some money. I agree. <laughs> and to answer your question, I mean, well, <laughs> I, I am looking at um, Eli's uh, e uh, email and he has one thing that's uh, materially incorrect that the PPA would subsidize batteries. It wouldn't, it would be the ESSA. Uh, well, but, it doesn't matter which it, it doesn't matter which is subsidizing them. Vince. The point I, is I, 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 I strongly disagree that when an attorney makes a statement like this, that the details are very important. And, you know, you're saying some details are important. Well, if some details are important, they're all important. Well, as but, long so, as but, you know, I, 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 I hear I, I hear the hesitation and it's a complex project mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, it, it as far as um, cost to Hardwick Electric go, okay, you know, attorneys had to review it. And I think that any project uh, of this size and, and this 
uh, legitimacy, whether or not, you know, it, it ultimately is well thought out enough. I mean, it requires that, that the utility review it. And, and it's just, it's a cost of doing business. Uh, regarding other costs, there's no inter interconnection cost. It's part of the project, and it's uh, specifically stated that the 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 uh, it will be part of the grant um, funding that will pay for it. So I mean, Vince, but Vince, you've asked for other commissioners to speak, and you sure. know, I, that's a classic example of the of the, the the problem we have. The interconnection study will determine whether or not you can even do this project whether you can have a solar array of the scale you've described alongside a battery, the scale you've described, whether the whole thing can even work. And so we're, we're going into this thing, trying to get the grants without having done the homework. And I know you've described that they're used to operating that way, but but it's a chicken or egg. I don't know how in the hell yeah, we're yeah, that's get a, that's a, great. That's how a good we're gonna point. get all this upfront engineering, legal work, planning funded and covered. And and so that you know if this airplane will even fly. You know, will this thing even get off the ground? And how much, how far are you gonna get committed? I admire each of you who have the entrepreneurial spirit to try to make this thing work. It'll be a spectacular thing to drag to draw $3 million into the Northeast Kingdom. God knows we need it. We need more people like you doing that. But we've got this problem here of, uh, you know, we, we, haven't done the, we haven't done the homework. It's not clear who's gonna pay for the homework to be done. We're hoping that we can just sort of get through without the homework done and get a grant. But are you really gonna get the spigot open on that kind of money before you do the basic building blocks of work here. And, and, and this is this, you've got an application data tomorrow, but really that's just a step toward the more serious application, the full right. submittal. And what are you gonna have by that date? And are you gonna have that critical homework done? Both in terms of financial impacts, positive, negative, where they flow, also the legal agreements, and perhaps most importantly, the interconnection study of whether the airplane can even fly. The, the last part is one that is a sticking point because it, it, I, I haven't, you bring it up now, I haven't thought, thought about that or a potential solution or a potential source of funding that would pay for it prior to you know, uh, actual funding with the grant. And you know the the timeline of of payments. Uh, did, bear with me for a second. Okay, I, I can't. I thought I had some some possible solution, but yeah, that that is a sticking point. So, uh, what? How would um, Encore do it? For example, they would fund the interconnection study uh, based on on an assumption or, I mean, you know, I, I based it on the fact that I, and I'm not holding you to this, Mike, this was like an off the cuff thing. And I asked you, you know, would one megawatt, uh, or, uh, one megawatt, would the circuit support one, uh, one megawatt discharge? Uh, and, you know, the response was, yeah, that's nothing. So, and I'm, again, it's not committing you to that or anything. I realized that, you know, a more complex, I mean, a complex load study needs to be managed, but I based it on that. So uh, I guess my comprehension of, of what was needed was a little bit rudimentary at that point. Uh, so how would Encore uh, fund that? I mean, they, they, they're gonna run into the same thing. I mean- it, it, Well, but you're, you're and I'm, I'm not, I, I think it would be better if one of the utility people here comment on this, but I'll surface it and then you can correct me. You know, the, the, the beauty of your project, as far as getting 3 million is the fact that you've put so many things together. That could be your project's undoing from the standpoint of whether both, whether, this, whether the system can handle it, but also whether we can actually come up with a way to operate and come up with the different legal agreements that are acceptable. 
So for example, if your peak period is you're generating on your panels and you're drawing and you're, you're drawing on your battery, you know, can, can you do both? You know, it's really the additive where it might be okay for the battery. It might not be okay for the battery plus the panels. And that's the devil in the detail that I think we just heard took another location and, and put it in trouble and caused a rescaling. Sure. And, a re yeah, yeah. and, and, and so, you know, I've seen, so it's seen all that. that. And then, you know, Eli surfaced the other questions that that brings up of the agreements and how, how each, how each is controlled, owned, governed. Uh, there's a lot of devil in the detail and it's tricky because I know you're not going to get the big federal money unless you put all this stuff together, but you put all this stuff together, you make it a, a big tangle for us to sort through when we don't have any money. We, we don't have any funding to be sorting it through. And I say we, I mean all of us. I don't mean Hardwick Electric. Right. This is you don't have a start of my... We don't this is the start of my flowchart of, of payments yeah. and relationships. <laughs> That's just the, <laughs> the start. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it, it is these types of things that, I mean, they are done. And, uh, you know, there are, you yeah, know, there are ways. Uh, I mean, I've seen ESSA tariffs. You know, there are 150 pages. It's because of the complexity that goes along with, you know, with when uh, how, and how things are going to be charged and discharged at what rates, who's going to be responsible. Uh, stuff like that. I mean, Ken and, and Mike, you guys are much more familiar with that than I am. Well, uh, okay. I guess the the point of this is that uh, you know, as much as I'd like to like it, to, I can't say that I'm not nervous about it. Other than that, I know, uh, having thought about it, I feel like there are solutions for everything. Uh, but at the same time, it is you know, it, it's. <laughs> Uh, as much as I want it, to some extent, I might be relieved if uh, it doesn't happen, just because I see a bunch of work down the road developing this stuff. But uh, in any case, um, just a, a, a side subject, but uh, related to this is, will Hardwick Electric, are there plans uh, to have uh, a behind the meter uh, dispatchable battery power uh, like uh, VEC or, or Green Mountain Power? I mean, that's, it's huge. Green Mountain Power has, has 30 megawatts uh, on demand right now you know, for peak shaving. I mean, it, it's, a, it, you know, it, it's, it's part of the, if you listen to VPR the last week, you know, all they're talking about is this type of thing. So, I mean, it, are there plans for, for that, Ken, for the development of that kind of uh, uh, system? Well, I think my first answer is that's really up to Mike and the trustee and the commissioners okay. uh, on what you want. Um, I will I will say this: we are actively working on utility scale storage, and by that I mean the one to three megawatt size that would go at a substation or on a particular circuit. Um, our view. To be perfectly blunt, our view of the batteries in a person's basement that GMP touts all the time is they're, they're not economic. And I've asked GMP multiple times to show me the, the math behind how they make that work. <laughs> and I have yet to receive that information. Um, I, looked, I looked at putting a battery in my own basement and could not make the numbers work. Um, unless I was willing to pay a pretty outrageous price for reliability myself. So, so to answer you from a VEPSA standpoint, we're focused more on the larger utility scale and not really on the home level batteries. If a member wanted to go to a home level, certainly we'll put the program together, but I don't think you're gonna be able to economically justify it for your customers in my view. It's not what I'm seeing for pricing right now. Yeah, the, I mean, uh, I, you know, I've seen VECs paying about six bucks a, uh, uh, six bucks a, what is the measurement? Uh, six bucks. Kilowatt month. A kilowatt month. Uh, yeah. Is that right? It, yeah, there's, a six, difference, six, though, yeah. there's a difference though between what's economical <clears throat> for the utility and yet you can set these tariffs up so that the utility makes money. I don't have any doubt about that. But when you put yourself in the customer's shoes and say, 
as a customer, am I getting value for the money I'm spending? It's actually very expensive for a customer to have that Tesla power wall or Generac battery or whatever it is in their home. It's more expensive than if the utilities offered a similar service at the circuit or substation level. Right. I, I, I yeah, I agree. I agree with you, except the battery at the circuit or substation level, the, the, the security that it's providing isn't the same security that the backup battery is providing the, the homeowner customer. And that has value that's beyond whatever the savings is. Essentially, the homeowner is buying this battery for security. And I mean, it worked. they do it in Connecticut, Mass. I mean, it's, you know, and, and you're basically not providing that choice to the customer to be able to, well, yeah, people can do it on their own, but, you know, providing that choice and then having having the additional availability of dispatchable power for peak shaving, you know, ultimately if it's di dis dispersed through, you know, 4,000 customers uh, that have batteries, and, you know, this is, it's not pie in the sky. This is a long-term thing. And that, that was one of the purposes of this, this project is to have itself amplify and, and fund. And uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, anyway, I, I guess what I'm saying is I'd really like to, as a, just as a uh, board member, I'd really like to see something like that and not leave it out because it, you're making an assumption for the customer that it's not affordable, so nobody's going to want it. I mean, people want it for a lot of different reasons, and it does, it does a lot of other things, too. And we don't, don't need to do lithium-ion batteries and do lithium-ion phosphate and just eliminate a lot of the issues, too. So anyway, that was my question. Sorry, and I appreciate you guys addressing this and, and looking at our project and you know, it's a lot of work and I know you put time into looking at it and, you know, if it doesn't work, great. But at the same time, I hope it stimu stimulated some conversation. Michael, uh, did you want to share some of your thoughts, Commissioner Michael? I did. <laughs> so, and we talked about this last time about where we were, where you are with your project. And we said, you know, the steps are your schematics and there's, oh, I just lost you guys. Well, hopefully you can hear me. Um, yeah. We, we talked about, you know, the different phases of putting the project together. You start with a concept, then there's a schematic design, which obviously we're not at yet. And then there's the uh, design of, this, of, of the system itself. And then there's construction documents and there's construction. So one of the questions is, would the grant put up money for the next phase for schematics in order to get that information? Or are we, are we trying to pre-fund that because you'll need that to get the grant to finish schematics so you really have something useful to tell them that we can look at and agree to. Because clearly everyone's talking about a lot of things here. We're jumping back and forth between what you need from us and then how much analysis is and isn't done. Um, more analysis is required by HED. Um, and I'm not sure when that happens or where you get the money for that. I don't know if the grant that you're going for gives you the money to do the next phase, which to me is simply just the, uh, the schematic phase you know, we're at concert. It's a great concert. I love thinking out of the box. I think it's great. But right now we have to get to the next phase of really understanding the economics and feasibility. If that money is available pre-grant, that's great because then we can have it before the next phase of your application. And I'm just wondering if your MOI, which is or MUO, that's a MOU, uh, is a requirement for you to put this grant application in. Um, do we have to do anything more from HED other than to say we're extremely interested. We like the idea. We're willing to help you in terms of the feasibility from our point of view and whether or not it's viable without having to make a commitment as a partner in the system, but just saying we're ready to help and we're interested. How much more do you need from HED on an uh, MOU to make that something you could apply for tomorrow? Yeah, that's a great question. I did ask the administrator. It is, it's like a prerequisite. Maybe there's some leeway in the level of commitment within in the MOU. I didn't ask him that because I didn't think it was, I didn't think of it as being an issue at the time. And the, now, but I do remember the stimulated uh, a memory of talking to the administrator that uh, the, the level of detail in the actual application does not require going through the interconnection study. Uh, and uh, I, I know these things, yeah, getting the timing right is, is, you know, critical, but uh, 
it's something I would call him about again, like tomorrow morning, uh, you know, just what the hell, you know, if, uh, if I can get you guys more information and it works out, but uh, the, the, my understanding was that uh, if there were costs associated with it, then they would be, they would roll over into the actual grant um, funding phase. And, uh, you know, I don't know that for sure. So I can't really say for sure. That's just going on memory. And, it, but it would seem to make sense, but, you know, it's just going on memory. Uh, yeah, I think we talked about like a six figure number to get this analysis done, to get you to right. the next phase, past concept board schematics. So that's a big number. So does that come before the grant? Is it part of the grant? You know, it's a big difference yeah. because to raise a hundred grand is a it, big it deal. Was, Right. Um, but yeah, and it would have to. And I don't know if we have to. I don't know. If, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Vince. Uh, I was going to say it would have to be part of the grant, which would push it into the funding phase. And okay, can we get to the funding phase uh, without having gotten the study, having gotten more detail? I don't. I don't know that. I, I guess I don't know the level of the, of the thing, and I don't know what it, what an acceptable application would be. I know that the last part of the MOU does specifically, I specifically wrote it that said it's all dependent on funding and otherwise all it, it's essentially void, the MOU. So, um, I mean, that, that's one fallback. <laughs> it's it's the weasel does language. Have to be, does HED have to be anything more than extremely interested in the project and ready to help with the feasibility when it comes around? We have to talk about partnership and and being, uh, doing something together and hey, we're really interested. It's in our territory. We're, we're happy to help it move along, um, but we're not gonna commit to any type of deal and partnership and agreement because there are so many factors, yeah. economic, stability, legal. Um, there's a lot of stuff to look at, but I don't wanna kill a project that's out of the box. It's, it's exciting. And it would it would have been helpful if I had asked that question, like what level of commitment could could we avoid having to sign the MOU? Because I didn't do that because it specifically stated, you know, the first question is who are the partners? What are their roles? When was it signed? How long have there, has their relationship been? What are their prior relationships? So, I guess I didn't I didn't think of asking whether or not that MOU or that that level of commitment could be signed. Uh, after the, the the submission of the, you know, the more detailed application, if if uh, yeah, it's a I guess it's a learning learning process. Um, so yeah, I, I I don't know. I I can ask him tomorrow morning, and you know, let you guys know what I find out, and if if it works to move on based on that, then great. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we are talking a lot of details tonight. Yeah, which have to be ironed out, but really have. The big elephant in this room is that you need something for tomorrow. And I'm trying to get us to a point where we can give you something right, at I, least this piece of paper that says, hey, we've got this from them and everyone's excited and let's go forward without us having to commit to something. Right. Because I going over the details that. is great and it should be done, but I'm not sure this is really the place to do it right now. There's too much to, to talk about. And clearly yeah, I, different I think people have different understandings of everything. Vince, for whatever it's worth, from my read of the Federal Register, as well as the guide for the letters of intent, you need a partnership. You need some right. kind of a legal entity. And we are not in the position to join a partnership. I mean, it's, 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 and, the, and there is no partnership document. I mean, you, you were trying to use, I think, the MOU as a partnership document. And it's not, and and there are a myriad of things that would need to be in a partnership document that just aren't there, um, and that are premature from from what we're being, you know, what our council is telling us, uh, because a partnership does involve commitments, and um, that's that's the chicken yeah, I, I, that I we're hear caught you. in. That's no. the chicken and egg that we're caught in. I I think that we, you know. As, as as Michael was saying, I think, you know, that we, you know, that we can support looking further into things, but again, even, you know, at what cost and at, at what level of involvement and um, I don't know that, that anything that we could say would give you 
what you need for the application because you speak throughout the the letter of intent about partners and you you could refer to hardwick electric as a potential partner but not as a partner and right um you know we can't say what was in the um in the loi and what was still in the loi that uh not the loi the mou that um this is your number six that uh the partners agree to collaborate and provide renewable energy services pursuant to the program narrative of the grant application attached to this agreement we, the undersigned, have read and agree with this MOU. Further, we have reviewed the proposed project and approve it. We're, we're just, you know, yeah. we, we might be there in six months. Right. Um, when there's more information, but we're not there now. And, and you know, may, you know, and you need now. Yeah, and, and I, I don't think that's unreasonable. I, I, I uh, agree with that it was my money i would go ahead and dive in <laughs> but it's not so i mean any uh anybody else uh, nat beth <laughs> no um susie who, yeah who is susan is she i have no idea who that is but I, I think it's, is it Susie Houston, uh, select board member in Crassberry? Uh, uh, possibly. <laughs> no, if it was someone who wanted a way in or not, but anyway. Um. Uh, all right, well, I guess where that leaves us is that it's not well developed enough uh, for you guys to review to be able to uh, give us what we need to be able to submit it. And, you know, I don't necessarily disagree with that. Uh, so, you know, I guess, uh, thanks for the efforts. Uh, and uh, I don't know, Kevin or Sten, you know, any other? No, just thanks for your time, um, everybody involved here. Uh, thanks for listening and researching and for coming up with ideas and filling us in on what we need to do better next time, it sounds like. So, and I want to say one more thing. It's a nice thing about being a local utility. I mean, this is one of the things that distinguishes it from, you know, dealing with GMP, for example, because, it, it you know, I think it's important for the small municipal utilities to be able to distinguish themselves from from their uh, not competitors but their counterparts and you know doing it this way this is great okay well thanks thank you all, thank you all for your efforts yeah thank you see you guys bye unless you want to hang out and Okay, um, I think that on the next item on the agenda is the monthly financial update from Beth. Had myself muted, sorry. Um, basically what I did is when you look at the comparison, it's the actuals um, as for the budget that we had talked about doing in there. I didn't notice anything really unusual for the month. So if you have something you have questions on, I'd be happy to entertain those. A question I have, that it was a comment you made, Mike, in your manager's report, and I don't intend to talk the manager's report till we get there on the agenda, but you had said you feel um, generally positive about the coming months of, of reversing some of the negatives. And after all, we're talking about, uh, you know, we're well into April. Uh, so you've probably got some feeling of how April's unfolding, how March went, what you're seeing for the prospects for May. Um, do you see us getting on the favorable side of things and on, on what schedule? <clears throat> I don't think we're gonna recover all of it, Roger, uh, but we, we will recover, I'm guessing, 75% of what we've gone under so far. Uh, we're coming into 
you know, May, June, July, August, those are our best performing purchase power months. Mm -hmm. um, and last year they were pretty impressive. If they're that good again, we'll be very, very near that 75, and maybe a little more percent recovery. Um, going into the fall will be the, the unknown at this point. And uh, that'll require some good, you know, short-term work by BEPSA, Ken and his team going into the, that part of the year. <clears throat> and generally we celebrate when we pick up the new industrial customers um with the, the absorption of our fixed costs um we'd be feeling that way you know if you get these new customers online and they're really consuming do we have a shot at that being one of the sources of improved performance yes yeah and we just got uh, the cannabis place online uh last wednesday and they were chomping at the bit ready ready to uh start planning and planting mm -hmm. and firing up all their lighting systems, which is going to be the, the mass amount of their loads, which I didn't realize. I mean, I knew they had a lot of lighting and I think I brought that to all of your attention, but the lights are actually um, a leased product from a company in California. And the company in California operates the lights. The lights have camera systems with infrared uh, temperature sensing, and they can actually pick out a, a microscopic fungus growing on a plant and get it out of the grow room before it spreads to the other plants. Pretty impressive operation. <laughs> Great. In, in terms of uh, the financials, one thing that, again, sort of looking at the catch up and trying to get a sense of it. Would it would it be difficult to do a monthly cash flow in terms of the cash flow projection? So we're you know to have how we see that sort of tracing through for the year. Um, I think you had mentioned this a couple of meetings ago, Lynn, and uh, I I Beth and I Beth and I talked about it, and we weren't exactly sure how you would want that structured. Okay. Um, and. Seeing as we have a CPA here to talk to, I'll let you two talk about it. <laughs> I I can I can give you an example of one that uh, yeah. that I I've gotten um, as as part of the financials for another board that I'm on. Um, I don't know if Roger or Michael or Nat or Vince have other examples of it, um, but it just strikes me that that would give us a sense. Mm -hmm not just of where we've been, but of where we're headed. Um, and can you send that to all of us and we can get comments on it? Yeah, and I just, go from I'll, there? I'll dig it out in the That's next That's great, yeah, so, I'm happy to review yeah. it. Like, I don't think it needs to be, um, I don't think it needs to be a, a huge process because yeah. we're not looking for extreme accuracy because it is after all projections. So, so it's almost a waste of effort to try to pretend you've got terrific accuracy. It's more identifying the main movers sure. and, and just creating a model. Um, and that will inform some of Mike's capital expenditures and other things right. as he goes. Anything else on the monthly financials? Takes us to the general manager's report. Did anybody have any other questions or comments? Hey, Doug, you were talking about the general manager's report. The yeah. uh, is the is the recloser uh, uh, the relay? Is that a manual relay? Are you guys doing it? Is it automatic? Is it remote? Yeah, it's uh, the relay is actually a Schweitzer uh, Engineering Labs product. It's all remote, all automatic. Uh, Schweitzer was one of the first microprocessor-based relay systems, and I actually purchased 
the first of their relays in the state of Vermont back in the mid eighties um, on a ring bus scheme up in Highgate. And they've morphed those into smaller and smaller uh, markets from transmission all the way down to now they're making reclosure controls, which is what this one is. But it's the same technology, same expertise, same quality product uh, with all kinds of bells and whistles and capabilities built into it. Well, uh, just curiosity, the, uh, uh, I know you talked about the, the meeting uh, with the uh, Memorial County Planning Commission. I just, there sounded like a good meeting, but I didn't really see any highlights. Were there any highlights there that like uh, concerning renewable energy? incentives and stuff that came out yeah that's it was all about um the committee finding out what each of the utilities within their county uh were doing along with uh to satisfy re renewable energy standards and to help consumers uh help the process and meet the numbers and meet the goals and julia was the kickoff speaker for the vepsa members she did a fantastic job um, and I was, you know, I'm not, I wasn't all that excited about the meeting, but it was actually kind of fun. And, uh, there was a lot of back and forth, lots of questions because there's a lot of information that you have to get it more into the weeds than, oh, this, this flyer says X, well, what does X mean? You know, and those are the things we kind of dove into. So I was just sharing that to, to let you know that there's, you know, those events with public outreach do go on and I do go to meetings at night. I was mm -hmm. at another one Saturday with Ken uh, up in Barton. Uh, that one was fun too. Wasn't a res one though. I think, I don't want to put words into Vince's mouth, but I think what he was maybe asking is, and I would be interested if maybe you could give us, if not at the meeting, send us a summary of what different utilities are doing in terms of meeting. Sure, I can do that. Some of these and some of these programs um, and the incentives, because there may be some things that we want to implement that others are doing and there's no monopoly on good ideas. Absolutely not. Yep. So, most, most of the stuff that we were doing was very similar, but there were a few, uh, there were a few off the wall kinds of things that weren't getting a lot of interest yet, but uh, other utilities were willing to try them because they had a couple customers ask about it. And, you know, who knows? It might explode into something or it might not. But yeah, I hear what you're saying. So, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ben. I was going to say, these are independent from these VIC funding? Yeah, these, the ones we were promoting were all our offers through VEPSA and through the VEPSA and uh, Efficiency Vermont Partnership. Okay. Yeah, and um, yeah, I meant Mike. Mark. Mike, you had mentioned that um, Julia's uh, presentation was really first rate. That yeah. might be an easy yeah. way to bring us. That might be the primary document. They can say were there any reactions or comments from the audience. I can get her slideshow and I'll share it with you and give you feedback on it. No problem. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and uh, Lynn, I had a question too. Taking advantage of, of um, I think I, I think Ken is still on here. Um, Ken and Mike combining their expertise. I was interested in this issue with Seabrook and what what the politics are, what's going on. Um, I, I understand that the the action we're going to take is to now go secure an additional year with Seabrook and kick the can down the road. But, and I assume that's because we kind of have to because the, we don't have the political, the, the politicians aren't making decisions. Am I, can you help us understand better what's, what's a, and I, this is a public meeting, so I understand you might need to be careful, but what's going on? Because <laughs> I think everybody who might watch us here would be interested in that. I'm gonna take it, Mike. No, oh, you, you are the expert. You had to inform me, so please run. Okay. Um, well, first of all, Mike knows I'm usually not careful, so I may 
say something inappropriate <laughs> here. Sorry if I do. Um, basically, what's going on is there's a couple things happening. Um, just from a, a power supply standpoint, we're we're still seeing the market trending up and pretty high right now due to natural gas. And everything that's going on in Europe is really wreaking havoc with the market here. So that puts us, all things being equal, we would tend to want to buy shorter term rather than lock and longer term right now because we think the market's high compared to where it could be in a year or two. Um, so that's kind of framing the issue. On the political side, we went into this legislative session expecting them to, to redefine the renewable energy standard. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of conversation that that was going to happen. Um, renewable Energy Vermont got Becca Balant to sponsor a bill they had, um, which would have really raised the tier two requirements. That's the, the solar uh, requirement, mm -hmm. which Hardwick is in good shape with, no matter what they do with your Billings Road project. But could have caused real problems for the rest of our members. Um, what we found was the more the legislature started to talk about what to do, the more controversy came up. So they've landed right now on kicking the can down the road, as you described, um, waiting till next year to do anything. We were concerned on the nuclear side in that We've been promoting um, a clean energy standard, which would say carbon free is good, whether it's nuclear or something else. The, the key issue here is don't put carbon into the environment. Mm -hmm. um, where the legislature was headed was more a renewable energy standard and really tightly defining what resources you could buy um, to the point where they were talking about throwing Hydro-Quebec out as not being carbon neutral because of flooding the, the valleys in northern Quebec as well. Um, so they were, they were really headed toward narrowing what our options were. Um, that's been now pushed out to at least next year. And we're being told by the Department of Public Service that they're, they're intending, uh, once the legislature goes home here, hopefully in a month or so, um, the DPS is going to convene all the utilities to talk about a complete redesign of the renewable energy standard and net metering, kind of combine those two programs, throw them all into a bucket and come up with a new approach to everything. Um, so we're advising that everybody kind of keep your cards uh, for now. And when we get into that conversation with the DPS this summer, that's the time where we'll be pushing for this clean energy look and bringing nuclear into the, the available options. Um, so that will hopefully we'll be able to set in a, a regulatory environment where we can do longer term purchasing for those type of contracts once the market settles out here um, in a year or year and a half. So we've we'd been hopeful that since we since we closed out the first half of the Seabrook replacement, we've been kind of waiting for the state to say nuclear is good, nuclear is non-carbon. Then we would have targeted another long-term agreement, correct, Ken? But correct. since that has not yet happened, we've been in this holding pattern, and it's now going to continue for probably another year. So it, the, with a uh, if say it was say it wasn't part of the renewable energy standard it could still be purchased for power correct it just would have to be offset by more additional recs yeah well the, the, yeah but you wouldn't get them go ahead Ken. The, the the issue we've got and, and it's it's very frustrating to be honest with you because the conversations you're hearing in the legislature are um, going to 100 percent renewable which means you conceivably could buy nuclear and then buy RECs to pair with it. But there is also a conversation about um, doing away with the ability to trade RECs separate from power. So the 100% renewable requirement would have to be linked to an energy purchase that is from renewable energy. And that's the part that concerns me because if you 
enter, say, a five-year deal for nuclear, and then that policy gets put in place where you have to buy renewable energy, then you, pro you could conceivably have to sell off your nuclear contract and buy something else. So we- If it, we if it was available. I'm sorry? It, it was available. I mean, it, it's, cra it's crazy activism. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, we're looking at the, like the offshore wind that's coming in in Massachusetts and, and some of the pricing there. I think, you know, the key here is we need to get a consistent, stable state policy that they can live with for more than 12 or 18 months because they're constantly changing it. It makes it very difficult to, to plan for the future. Um, so in this case, we, we're pretty sure that we've got a year, the decision won't be made for at least a year Natural gas prices are high, so we, we can lock in one more year of nuclear with Seabrook and feel confident we'll be able to use that to meet the state requirements. What happens in the next legislative session is anybody's guess right now. Um, I'm hopeful we can, when we sit down with the Department of Public Service this summer, we can reach something that you know all the utilities and the DPS are in agreement with, and I think that will will make it more likely to go through next next year in the legislative session and we'll have some more stability. But right now we don't. So it sounds like what you're gonna do this summer is tr try to at least as much as you can structure and frame the narrative and sort of use that back with the legislators to, to, to try to help them get to something that's practical. Yeah. Do you have, do you have uh, like uh, position statements for different legislators for uh, you know the various topics. You know, for example, nuclear. Would you know what you know uh, the individual legislators what their state what their position is, so that you know if we as individual rate play, rate payers or voters could wanted to engage with them, we could we'd know what their position was, and we could actually you know address our concerns or. Uh, imprecations to, to, to them. Yeah, we, we do. I would answer that we know most of the legislators where they land. I'm not sure we have that in a format that we could hand out today, but that's a great idea uh, to put together. We, we, we use with within VEPSA, we do use it with the lobbyists. Um, so on the particular energy committees we're, we're dealing with, we, we know pretty closely what each of those legislators position is and how we can try to influence them. If the person is not on the committees we normally deal with, we don't keep that close to track. So, um, you know, tying it to a particular hard work representative or Crossberry representative, um, that would take a little more work than we've put in at this point. Right, it is, it's a, it's a K Street manual. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> Yeah. Hey, Lynn, uh, Mike, Mike is going to leave pretty soon. We better get going. Sorry, I'm good. Sorry. I'm good. Okay. okay. You're still good. All right. I had a question on, on the AMI funding. And I was just, so is, is, has the 5 million been appropriated and the 11 million is on top of the five or it's six more than the five? The original got the original made it through the house, and now VEP's efforts are trying to get the Senate to crank it up to 11 million. And Ken, can you talk about the split of those dollars and where they would go? Because it's not just VEP's members that would get uh, these monies. That was anticipating the second part of my question, which was how much would would HED get yep. if we get the 11 versus the five. So the, if we get the 11, it would be 50% funding for the VEPSA member projects, correct, Ken? Correct. Correct. So, so the way the number got, this has been created a lot of confusion in the legislature as well, uh, but the way the number was created was the VEPSA project across all of our members is projected to be $12 million. So we had asked the legislature for 50% funding which would be $6 million to VEPSA. 
the other five million dollars that was asked for to get to 11 that money would be earmarked for WEC and VEC for for Washington Electric to replace their entire system which is an old antiquated AMI that technically it's AMI but it like has daily reads and it's not very usable um, and then VEC has some parts of their territory that they couldn't put AMI in in 2009 and they want to expand to those areas. So out of the original $11 million request, VEPSA would have gotten 6 million and that was to fund 50% of our costs for each of the members. Um, 5 million get out of the house. We just learned this afternoon that the Senate uh, Appropriations Committee has bumped that up to 8 million. So that's what they're gonna be uh, voting out and they changed the 50% coverage to allowing up to 70%, um, which I have suspicions about why that was done. It's a political maneuver. I don't think we'll end up there at the end of the day, um, but it's pretty likely now we'll end up with 8 million instead of five um, with a 50% match. So that gets us pretty close to, you know, 35 to 40% of the VEPSA AMI project would be covered by the state funds. Um, we've also been told by several of the senators on appropriations that they would like to get us to the full 11. They didn't have the money in this round, but they're keeping it on their list for the Budget Adjustment Act um, or for possible appropriation next year. So I, I don't think it's a done deal with the eight, we may get a little bit more, um, but I'm feeling pretty comfortable we, we'll be at the 8 million by the end of this year. Which would give us 50% funding. It would, it would give VEPS a, of the, I'm in trouble with math in my head, but. Um, more like 40 or slightly less. Yeah, around 40. Is, is there, is, so the, in, the, in the legislative bill, there's no priority for, um, the utilities that have that don't have any AMI at this point. I mean, as opposed to having antiquated systems. So and we've probably got some funding for those systems. So, so this is the strategic um, position we ended up taking. We didn't want to have the fight between BEPSA and the co-ops in the legislature. So we've left the language pretty general. But we've been working, the way the funding would work is it would give the $8 million to the DPS okay. to, for them to do a grant for one or more projects. And we've been working with the DPS for three years now explaining why we need the AMI project. So I am still keeping the door open that we could get the $6 million, you know, through an argument in the regulatory side, but I, I can't guarantee that. The, the language doesn't require the DPS to, to fund it that way. But you do kind of have an ace in the hole there. We've got, a, we've got another fight to have in the regulatory realm where we could possibly get six of the 8 million for us, yes. That would be, that would be nice. Okay, um, anything else on the general manager's report? Is there any other business? Okay, so the next item is an executive session. Um, I would like to make a motion that we move into executive session to discuss a confidential, uh, a potential contracting issue, the premature disclosure of which would be prejudicial to the interests of Hardwick Electric Department. Beth, you might want to read that back because I think I kind of zigged and zagged in there a little bit. Can't hear you. All right, I got it on the video. Is there a second? I didn't get, I didn't get it all, so I was just going to go back to the video and get it. Okay. But I did get you making the motion. <laughs> I think Vince seconded, did I see that? Yes. Okay. Is, I second the third. Is there any discussion? 
Um, hearing none, all in favor of going into the second <coughs> session? So we will say right. good night, Ken. Thanks, Ken. Appreciate Thank everything. You so much. Thanks, Ken. Thank you so much. Bye. Good night. And it is 7.01 and we are in executive session and the recording can go on. We need the recording. It is 7.22 PM. We are out of executive session. No action was taken. Um, okay, I, I will move to go into executive session to discuss a confidential employee matter. Is there a second? Second. Any objection? Who do you want me to put down as the second? Three people raise their hands. Pick okay. one. Pick one. Okay. Any objection? Hearing none, it is 7.23 p.m. and we are going into executive session. It is 7.36 and we are out of executive session. No action is, has been taken. So we've done an evaluation of race, you know, of the wages and recent increases for all of the other utilities. Um, that are all of the, all of, certainly all of the nearby utilities and, and, and their concerns in this environment of short staffing uh, about retaining staff. Our staff are well-trained and providing great service to our customers. And it's important that we maintain that. Um, so after evaluation of so recent increases in wages and the actual wage levels in surrounding utilities and concern about retaining staff, I move that we authorize Mike to implement an economic adjustment and wage increase consistent with our approved budget. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? No discussion, okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. You knocked it out of the park, Lynn. Nice job. <laughs> I could read my own scribbling. Um, okay. Uh, is there any further business? Is there a motion to adjourn? I so I moved. Yeah. Nat needs a second. a second. Sure. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Have a good evening. Enjoy the coming snow. Mike, have a great vacation. Yeah. Thank you. And we thanks. And great meeting. <laughs> we are adjourned at 7.38 p.m. Good night, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye.